everyone, and welcome back to the Brightworks in another match of Beyond All Reason, where today we're taking a look at a match that was uh, not so recently played, actually. This is a bit of an older replay that was sent on over to me, and that does bring up the question, how old of a replay is too old of a replay? That's something that I know a lot of casters, commentators of a whole bunch of different things always have to gripe with. I feel like uh, a couple months probably puts it pretty far behind, but sometimes this game does move fast. Sometimes the changes are very pronounced between patches. But anyway, today's spawning on the southern lowlands, well, kind of the middle lowlands of Ascendancy. It's going to be our blue team leader as a Cortex commander who goes by the name of Korra. Korra coming in at 32 open skill and silver chevrons to boot. Going to be showing us exactly what they've got to, well, got to put out on the field on this very metal rich map. Going for a solar panel already and going to be going for a couple of wind turbines here as well. And then eventually into a vehicle bay. I think that makes a lot of sense on this flat open terrain. Although I will say I do like bots for their ability to traverse these little slopes and hills without too much of an issue on this lowland there's actually ice and you can see in the bottom left hand corner of your screen tanks have 120 percent movement speed bots have 90 percent and hovers have 140 percent movement speed very interesting i wonder if that makes up the difference of hover tanks and other hovercraft being uh disappointing disappointing in in, in large scale but uh yeah i'm pretty curious about that anywho on the northern part of Ascendancy here, it's our red team leader, and they go by the name of Grico Bratko. Hailing from Germany with 35 open skill and bronze chevrons with a silver tail as we speak, going to be showing us what they've got. Already claiming one of their metal extractors and putting down the second one here as well. Constructor will be queued up to go claim that third one and build some wind turbines, and all looks well right now for the red commander. Let's talk about the map a little bit. Ascendancy, one of the most beautiful skyboxes in the entire game, by the way. Just look at that. Beautiful beautifully done look at those mountains and the the moon and the landscape and all that sort of stuff very very neatly done love that sort of thing i wish more maps would have that sort of thing apparently it was ai generated or partially ai generated uh that's hearsay though i'm not sure i don't have direct confirmation from the map maker but that's just what i've been told i don't really think it matters that much though for a for a skybox i don't know you let me know how much you tolerate that kind of thing i'm pretty i'm pretty skeptical of ais in general abominable intelligences and whatnot but uh i think certainly for applications like that where you need a nice little pretty picture to put in the background it could be quite useful. Uh, Ascendancy, though, aside from its skybox, does have some pretty interesting matchups here. So there's essentially a 1v1 that goes on this mountain up on this high ground over here. There's another 1v1 that goes in this, like, low ground just below the mountain. And then there's basically a 2v2 that goes in this central area over here. And then another 1v1 or 2v2 on this lowland area over here. So it depends whether your backliner here will tech or whether they will commit to units on the front line. It's kind of a tricky thing, but if you manage to read it properly, you can sometimes overwhelm your opponent. Like, say, for instance, the brown commander decided to go for tech, and the blue team realized that they could send an overwhelming number of T1 forces and crush through this, but it's a very difficult thing to read, and if you don't have a lot of experience in the game, that can certainly be something that newer players might get caught off guard by. This northern highland is also a very difficult one to contest. You've got very narrow room here to push units forward. It means that sturdy, strong, single units with uh, a lot of HP and a lot of sustain are going to be powerful. So things like thugs, things like centurions, things like uh, aggravators and rocketeers work really well up there as well. Wouldn't be surprised to start seeing production of that immediately. We do have, uh, yeah, construction, or pardon me, uh, resbots, aggravators, and grunts being pumped out from both of these commanders. Both Cortex going to be spawning some of those bots. Sending them up to the high grounds right here, vying for control over these 3.1 metal extractors that are very, very valuable. I don't see any transports carrying commanders around, so it leads me to believe that there's probably the transports cannot carry commanders tweak enabled. Very popular tweak at the moment. There's been a lot of talks about reworking that sort of thing, allowing commanders to be carried by transports or not. Where do I stand on the issue? Uh... I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. I learned this game, and I've always known this game at a point where commanders have been able to be transported. I think it's viable to transport your commander forward, especially on some maps that are just ginormous. But then again, I do understand the frustrations of having your commander suddenly killed, uh, or, or rather having your base suddenly killed by a rogue commander dropped into the back line can be very frustrating. I did like Hornet's approach to balancing it, where you essentially just slow down the transports if a commander is riding in them. I think that's a fair enough compromise. It makes them much more vulnerable. I think it means a single fighter can take down a transport carrying a commander. Usually a fighter will pass the transport because they move so fast before it can kill it. In the uh, the default mode, anyway. There's a lot of there's a lot of different options on the table, but I think that that change really helps quite a lot. Helps helps address the issue at the very least. Bear and Luis B288 going to be going up against each other here. Underscore, underscore, bear, underscore, underscore. We do have Shuriken up in the air as well. Trying to paralyze any of these grunts that they can. Ah, uh, Rocketeer shooting their own units in the back here. 
Uh, at the very least, those shuriken are quite nice for paralyzing a bunch of this stuff. Yeah, you know what? A little bit of close air support does mean that those shuriken can catch most of this army, opening up an opportunity for all of these ticks to run on by. There we go. We catch a resbot. That's uh, the same amount of metal in ticks as resbots, so that was definitely worth the snipe right there, leaving behind just about 30 metal. Rocketeer is firing away as well. Boom goes the constructor, and that's pretty annoying. Constructor going down on the front means you can't go for any sort of heavy laser tower pushes or anything like that. You really are hinging on using that to push on the front line, especially if you're playing as a bot versus bot commander. Those static defenses can be very powerful. A little bit of a pull on the southern side right here is Tamantio. The yellow commander right here is beset upon by a bunch of purple grunts. Not going to be able to bring that commander down, though. Actually, not doing much damage at all. 84% still remaining on that yellow commander. LLTs, grunts, all that sort of stuff doing fabulously. Uh-oh, Brown Commander slacking on the APM right here, dealing with a little bit of a run-by previously, and now has a whole bunch more units pushing forward right here. It's just good strategy. You poke the weakest link, and oftentimes that weakest link will be color-coded. does make things a little bit tricky there. I can't help but wonder if maybe one day we'll see this game switch over to the uh, anonymous mode as the default. That way you can... Or maybe the anonymous mode for enemies, right? So that the enemy team doesn't know who exactly they're fighting against, but, the, uh, but your team still has colors. I think that would be the most fair, right? For now, though, it remains a strategic part of the game, trying to figure out the appropriate the appropriate side to put pressure on, right? Whether it's the le the, the less, the, the quote-unquote least skilled member, right? The least open skill player on the team uh, versus fighting the highest skill player. It's definitely going to be an easy decision for a lot of these commanders. The anonymous mode, by the way, what it does for anybody that might not have played with it before. It's, it's very common in the free-for-all setting. Uh, but basically what it does is it makes everybody look like they're the same color, and it turns all the... Uh, ID names into question marks, but it's very difficult for if you're playing with a team because of course suddenly you can't tell who your teammates are and if you want to give units to one of your team members, uh, yeah, you have no idea of telling where on the map they're actually at, so it's, it's very tricky to resolve that. I would love to see, oh, nice snipe up here on the northern side, almost missed it right there as the orange commander does, does go down to all the rocketeers from Bear. Quite a hefty army right here from the cyan blue commander right now. Bear pushing forward with those rocketeers, more than enough of them to deal with basically any army at this point. What a tremendous scaling right here. One or two good engagements, and just like that, Bear is now in a phenomenal position. Meanwhile, on the southern side, Duke Nukem feeling pretty good as well. We have some shuriken up in the air. The commander will have enough laser power to blast those down for now, but the Janus that are remaining will be more than enough to reinforce this commander, making sure that it isn't in too much trouble. Ah, you know, I say that. Medium tanks now jumping on top of Duke Nukem's commander. He needs that D-gun charge, but he doesn't have the energy for it. Oh, no. Caught between a rock and a hard place is the Hot Pink Commander fleeing north for support right here, but the northern line has already crumbled. So many Rocketeers available at this point for Bear. As long as we keep it spread out, they're going to be efficient enough. Those medium tanks eh, having a hard time right here, but Duke Nukem does manage to escape. Janus tanks also connecting whenever and wherever they can. Meanwhile, northern side. Quickly won right here by the Red Commander. We did see a double commander trade right here, but it looks like the Red Commander did manage to absorb the vast majority of that metal as you can tell they're already spamming out thug after thug after thug sending them out to the front line trading them out against the grunts over here of the green commander going to be drying up the resource pool right here for rage rage no longer with any units left in production right now we are seeing thugs come up right here but obviously more stuff beats less stuff not enough build power on this lab either oh no these constructors were told to build build power but they never detached from the lab ah, that's a terrible unfortunate mistake just a little bit of a just a little bit of a micro uh, macro mistake sort of a thing very easy to make very very difficult to catch you just assume that your units are doing one thing and then suddenly they are not resbots uh yeah patching up this graveyard of units right here We're gonna be resurrecting some of these thugs and sending them to the front line not the end of the world not the most necessary thing ever but certainly helps every thug on the battlefield does help T2 units waddling around over here. We do have a uh, tan constructor. Not sure how on earth this ended up over here. The tank commander down south here. Oh, is using uh, transport to transport these commanders or, or these constructors. Are lovely stuff. LK Raven, the brown commander here, holding very idly. I think what we need to see is some sort of an investment into either tech or into some sort of aggression right here. Korra has essentially remained uncontested. Resbot's eating up a lot of this wreckage over here, actually cleaning up this battlefield quite nicely for Julie, the Seafoam, or pardon me, the Powder Blue Commander. Janus is being blasted apart here as well. They will, oh, well, friendly fire. We'll take him out before the Janus missiles manage to uh, kill those Resbots right there. Wolverine's firing away right now for Korra, who is trying to push forward on the front lines. We do have a Resbot picking up that construction vehicle and trying to get it ready and set again. 
Uh, yeah, that's a Dragon's Moth. Pop up Flamethrower turret right there. So that's partially what's keeping these uh, Wolverine safe and sound right now. It's a two versus one on the southern side. It's the Brown Commander has moved up to the northern side and essentially left for Tomat and Tio all alone right here. I'm imagining Tomatin is tomato. I don't know what Thia Thilo is. Tomatin Thilo? Thilo? Or no, it's German, right? Yeah, from Germany. Hmm. How do you how do you say what is that with the German inflection? I know it's Tomatin, but then I don't know what the, the, the TH sounds like. Anyways. Somebody in the comment section will surely point it out. <laughs> Are we ready for T2 is the question. We sure are. We're going T2 right here for the Powder Blue Commander Julie, who's got those T2 mexes up and running and is getting ready to make that very expensive transition into that T2 laboratory. Once these mexes are up and running, pumping out 8.4 metal per second is enormous. Army over on the right-hand side also continuing to push forward here as well. Shuriken in the air to try and stop a whole bunch of this, but really not able to do much. There's only so many of them, and with the grunts in the back, they can slowly but surely whittle those down here as well. Run forces to run forward, and just like that, essentially an even fight right here between the red and green commander, but the red commander has the luxury of red spots to reclaim all this metal and continue the push forward right here, as well as all the production to make sure that these thugs continue streaming out. We should see some sort of a economic investment on the back of this, though. Yeah, kind of strange not to see any sort of economic growth right here from Greco Bracco. Expanding the economy should be paramount to success. Not quite seen it right here for the red commander yet. Just committed to pumping out those T1 units, trying to win the lane before going for any sort of tech transition. Definitely difficult when you have to deal with those shuriken all of a sudden. If your air player doesn't have the APM to spare to support you, and you've been left in a very tricky situation. Battle paused. Battle started. Shuriken trying very hard to clean all this up. There's a massive graveyard of thugs over here. If we turn on our metal vision, we can even see. 2.3 thousand metal right there. That's a full-blown T2 transition in and of itself. Twin guard set up over here as well. Going to be trying to keep the... Well, pardon me. Going to be trying to keep the base all nice and set. That's the hardest part Battle of this map. Caused. The way that the camera Battle moves up started. and down. There's technically settings for it, but if I change them for Battle this map, started. then I'd have to change them back for everything else. It's a mess. A little bit of a pause right here. Just uh, kind of sorting themselves out here. Nice that the replay finder doesn't uh, yeah, make us watch every one of those pauses. All right? It saves me some uh, editing APM. <laughs> the thugs firing up into the air to hit the shuriken is so desperate. Again, I've talked about this before, but it feels like the thug is just kind of running its its numbers and it's like, ah, you know what? Technically, that's in range. Not, not usefully, but technically, it's in range. We're just porking up at this point. Stalling for time is what this says to me. Rage understands that there's effectively no way that they're going to efficiently stop this army. So the best that they can do is just set up a whole bunch of pork and hope that the army can't really push through all of it. At least before his team makes some sort of game-winning move. But Hope is fading quickly right here on the southern side. So at the very least, Bear has an impressive push right now. Welder and Hounds out right now to shut down these grunts that are pushing forward. But there is still quite a few of them out and running. And they're looking for whatever bases they can find. But there are T2 units to go clean all that up. I don't think it's the end of the world. And I think with the advantage that Bear has right here, the positional advantage on the map. With all the metal that is being denied to the Orange Commander, that's certainly going to be a massive advantage to... The Cyan Commander, who is now up to T2, just finished up the Fusion Reactor 2. means we can start eating up the T1 solar panels, the wind turbines, the even advanced solar panels, if you so choose. There we go. Resbot's eating up the remainder of these thugs. And in fact, I wouldn't even mind seeing most of these eaten up. Just consume all 3,500 metal worth of these thugs and go directly into T2. We've already got the T2 lab up and running, so we can just afford to start spamming out some of those units. Try, sorry. Trying to keep the camera movements as smooth as possible on this map. It's very jagged. We have uh, Wind Turbine sanded over here to the Orange Commander, so that's nicely done. Trying to help that Commander out a little bit because they are in a little bit of a pickle. Taman Teal continuing to push on the southern side here. Essentially just stalling until help arrives because this T1 army is twofold. We've got Shmiwen and Farron both pushing forward right here. Very tricky for the Yellow Commander because if you lose this army, then there's effectively nothing. Even if you trade this army for one of these... There's nothing stopping your other opponent that you're going up against from pushing right now. Tabatan seems to be very keenly aware of that and is, playing, is taking this very, very safely. Trying to make sure as many of these units stay alive, keeping them well spread out, making sure that every one of these units moves very delicately on the battlefield here. We do have hounds pushing out to the front lines. It could be the difference that the yellow commander needs getting those hounds out on the field. Of course, does mean that we are in a better position here to go ahead and start 
tearing down T1 infrastructure. All these static defenses are forfeit as soon as the hounds start to fire away, and we do have the radar and radar jammer bots included here as well. Looking quite good for the yellow commander, but it's it could be a case of too little too late. We need to see these hounds get some value immediately. Start dismantling this T1 army, waste the thousands of metal invested in it. We're going for an agitator here. That's good for the yellow commander because it means that that's metal being spent on static defense rather than being spent on economy or anything back home. Uh, speaking of economy, we do have a fusion reactor pop down right here for Farin. Not the end of the world, a fusion reactor, only 4,000 metal as opposed to the about 9,000, I believe. It's 9,000 or 9,700. Oh, let me double check that right there. Yeah, 9,700 for an APHIS, so almost 10,000 metal. You don't get nearly as much energy out of it, but it's certainly very, very valuable. Uh, Rocketeers have stalled long enough, though, and those hounds are now starting to work away on that T1 army. The Gauntlet technically outranging the hounds. It's sort of a very ineffective way to counter hounds. It, it can work, but it's a low efficiency strategy, I guess is how I'd, how I'd label it. Not the end of the world, but certainly uh, once you get enough hounds, once you get that critical mass, then no static defense is really going to stand up to them. Their specialty is in destroying static defense. Big bomber wave coming across the map right here. Nicely done by a nonxx underscore twitch. I guess another uh, twitch streamer out here going to be showing us how it's done on the bombers. Fighters cleaning all this up as well. The fighter escort keeping those bombers safe. Uh, flak truck doing a great job of shooting them down, though. Yeah, the AOE on the flak is deadly. Bombers connect eh, with some solar panels. Probably not their best target right there. And eventually cleaned up nicely by the flak truckers. Quick response right there from Duke Nukem. Manages to shoot down those bombers before they do critical damage. All said and done, I think that was deflected really, really quite nicely. Sharpshooters, welders, and hounds out for the, C the uh, Powder Blue Commander right here. Green and purple commanders losing it all now to the hounds. The rocketeers are essentially antiquated at this point. They've been reduced to slag, rubble, and debris. But the hounds are now continuing to press forward. We've got ticks on the front as well. As long as we switch the hounds into their other mode, they're in their heavy plasma, but if we switch them to their gauss mode, they're actually going to be perfectly fine against the ticks, as long as they're not being streamed out in gargantuan numbers. Easy to do with ticks, of course. They're very mass producible, but there are perfect counters. Welders, sumos, and certain, certain siege units even. I wouldn't say Sheldon's, but certainly the Hound has the potential to be micro a little bit better against them. Manticores for anti-air defense right here. Wise from the Orange Commander, realizing, hey, if they're going for bombing runs, probably best to keep myself safe. Trying to the very least make sure I can clean up my own airspace when uh, the air player fails to do so. Red Commander continuing to expand right here. We're going for the advanced geo up on the high ground here. We've got fighters up on the northern high ground as well. A uh, air lab set up up there, and we're going for some T2 economy in the back lane here. Fusion reactors, some... Uh, energy converters as well. All making sure to try and spend that metal as much as possible. Uh, Spybot moving forward. Oh, Spybot moving forward. Oh, it was detected before it could detonate. That Spybot had an opportunity for a killer detonation. Did not manage to seize the day. Ticks here. Excellent for scouting for these Spybots. Oh, the other one will be brought down. Oh, no. They're the last hope of the Orange Commander who is desperately outnumbered right now. We need fiends on the battlefield instead of more Sheldons. There we go. Fiend's finally pumping out right now. This is looking wonderful for Bear. Whoa! Nuclear missile connects over here on the right-hand side. Heard the explosion, but didn't see it. That's going to be Korra's base, wiped from the map right here by a nuclear sh missile sent across the map and directly into the heart of the blue base. Nothing left standing right here for the blue commander as far as production goes, but there is a T1 bot lab up on the front line. I guess a little bit of a contradictory statement right there, but at the very least, we'll be able to rebuild with this T2 constructor that was spared. Gonna send some constructors back to go claim those mechs and sure, surely build some more build power to repower that lab. Ticks sprinting forward at this point. T1 medium tanks not gonna fare too well against the hounds. Yeah, forces being devoted northward here. It looks like we have a whole bunch of hounds moving up that direction. Hounds, welders, even some radar jammers, all sorts of good stuff. Our queue on the southern side. Ten hounds, one welder, two jammer bots. Usually I go for about a one-to-one -one ratio, but sometimes I like to mix in those webbers as well. Spybot. Spybot again looking for that miracle connection. Ah, not finding it though. The control of those spybots is definitely wanting for more here. Luis B288 apparently maybe having some ping issues or some such. Unable to detonate those spybots perfectly and it is starting to cost quite a lot. Every one of those spybots costs so much energy. Massive nuclear missile sent out now. Yep, we're putting it right on the front lines here. Oh, no we're not. Never mind. Pardon me. Missile sent straight into the back. No anti-nuke available. Boom! 
goes the base of Tony Triple Shot. 16 open skill and nothing left to the name of the, the uh, purple, the lavender commander. That's the name of that color. That hurts. That hurts. That hurts quite a lot. Bomber sent forward here. Fighter escort is non existent. Shut down quite nicely by the Maroon Commander. Ah, even still, some of them managed to make it through. Always impressive how sturdy those bombers are, but despite fighters eventually tailing after, the bombers are all shot down quite nicely here. Commander falls over on the northern side of the uh, middle of the map here. Sharpshooters moving forward, dismantling whatever they can. Dragon Squad pop up turret. Oh, there we go. Manages to take down two of the sharpshooters. Well, all right. Not how that fight is supposed to go right here. Sharpshooters, wow, without any of their vision, suddenly losing to static defense. Essentially what they're designed to counter. Not what I think the blue commander was expecting right there. Southern side is ready for some aggression. You know what I'd also love to see? Maybe a little bit of amphibious assault. Starting to send some salamanders or some uh, some amphibious units across the map over here. We do have platypus that we can produce out of this lab. Platypus not the most overwhelmingly dangerous unit in the game, but certainly powerful. One of their hidden superpowers is, of course, their ability to fire anti air missiles. So you can park them under an enemy air wall from a strange position, and suddenly you can find yourself t tearing down their T1 fighters. And, uh, yeah, you're, suddenly the enemy is like, hey, where'd all our fighters go? Discover that they've all been lost here. Shuriken paralyzing a bunch of medium tanks. Very nicely done. Trying to save some of those sharpshooter right here. Very heavy investment for those sharpshooters, so I love to see that we're cleaning all this up. Sparing our teammate from losing those very expensive units. It's the kind of thing I expect out of a, a coordinated air player. Making sure to keep any any investment that we can safe and sound. We have Weber's and Recluses send up north here. One of my favorite compositions, another nuclear missile was launched, by the way, from the Maroon Commander. One of my favorite compositions, the Weber Recluse. The Recluse obviously paralyzing any of the uh, units that it comes into contact to. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, I keep... <laughs> I keep misjudging where the nukes are headed. Boom, goes the green base just like that. Schmilen loses it all right here. Where are the anti-nukes? Nobody on the blue team with the anti-nukes right now. Shiva had been produced out of the lab on the top hand side. The uh, red commander just happy to continue production. Now has some of these amphibious assault siege units. The not assault units, siege units. Amphibious siege mechs. Getting ready to march forward right here. These are all pop-up. These are all pop-up. Pardon me. We get a nice camera view. There we go. Shiva doing a great job of sieging all this. They have those missiles, which are obviously great for firing away at a lot of this stuff. The repair turret's going to be critical for keeping all this alive. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Those Shiva missiles are very powerful. Very nicely done right here by the Red Commander. Going up to Tech Ladder, but also choosing the appropriate unit for the appropriate moment. Blue Army. Moving into position right here. We do have a spy bot. Another one. Please. Please. Yes! Finally, we get a decent spy bot connection from the Orange Commander, who finally manages to land one. Putting that spy bot directly into the clump of hounds right there. It's about a fourth of this army, so cutting down their power drastically for sure, but definitely not a game ender. Yeah, Tick's so annoying right here for the Sheldon to deal with. That's what you need the Sumos for. Sumos deal with Tick's quite fabulously. The site has been allowed a chance to build up. We had T2 units so long before the Purple Commander did, the Purple or the Green Commander did, and they've been given all the time in the world to build up over here. And now suddenly, there's uh, no hope of breaking through this. We do have an anti nuke coming up right here, but it's not built. That would be a fabulous target for a nuke. Clearing out front lines can be just as dangerous as killing a back line, because obviously, you open up those defenses, any number of sprinting units can move forward. There's the nuke on the front over here. Vera loses that static defense, but luckily the units were pushing forward. There are a bunch of landmines up here. It's going to be very dangerous for this composition to push forward into. We do have sharpshooters, though, which are quite nice. Those are medium mines, too, so they'll be more than plenty effective against those uh, T2 units. Essentially, the landmines correlate to the tech level, roughly speaking. Heavy bomber also colliding with a lot of these. An elegant solution to the sharpshooter, if not an expensive one. Shiva over here have been dealt with by pulsars. Okay. And it's annoying for the red commander to deal with. The, yeah, those pulsar, pulsar porked up towers are going to be really difficult to clean up. The pulsars make it very expensive to stay in range or push very far without really committing to the pit. Kurganeth pushing down the hill over here and trying to push into the uh, into the base of the Seafoam Green Commander. A couple of wasps trying to clean all this up. It does have a little anti-air backpack missile, so it will shoot these down eventually. Red Commander losing all their fighters over here. 
And the blue commander is pushed back. Despite an overwhelming advantage on the map right here, the blue team is suddenly losing multiple angles at once. Yeah, the uh, recluse is here. Pushing forward to paralyze whatever they can. Shiva, ooh, firing its missiles, won't be able to pop the fusion reactor, though. It's okay, though. The recluses are on the job. Firing away at those uh, beamer turrets. We need to pop the build power here. Build power is of the utmost importance. Those recluses have been mismicroed right now. Firing away at uh, static defenses that are being constructed. Well, they won't be able to do it. The Hornets, or not the Hornets, pardon me, the Wasp gunships will be able to push them back. Nicely done by the air player. Managing to keep that all nice and safe. I think it's time to see some amphibious units, yeah. Both of these commanders neglecting amphibious units, and I think it's to the death of them. You can imagine two or three hovercraft runbys through one side or the other, popping the build power, popping the energy converters, popping the entire economy. Could be devastating. Especially since we have the vehicle bay here for the, the uh, brown commander, we could see those turtles being built. Turtles have the superpower of being extremely tanky relative to their metal cost. Sounds like I feel like I'm yelling. There we go. Not bad. Uh, are we ready to continue scaling the economy, though? We sure are. Fusion reactors coming up over here for the Red Commander. Going to start investing in more and more fusion power in the back line. Trying desperately to uh, get that ever so important energy infrastructure up and running. The uh, Persecutor has been set up. The pop up plasma turret. <laughs> Slowly but surely whittling away all the static defense over here. Sure. Why not? That's just a dragon's teeth, not a uh, pop-up turret, so not the end of the world, but there goes the build power. A little bit more important. Do we have any more pop-up turrets? We have a single pop-up turret remains. Whoa, massive nuclear connection. Beautifully put right now, my goodness. Four or five tremendous nuclear connections means the blue team keeps getting set back. Despite all their position on the map, because of these nukes, the economies are now flipped on their head. I think that was the nail in the coffin right here that pushed the red team into the lead. They were about neck and neck, but now it's about a 100-ish metal lead for the red team per second. That's an extra couple T3 units every minute. That's an extra load of T2 units. Yeah, we're looking for the right options here in the middle, but I feel like it's time to start thinking of slow siege units. We need things like Starlight's out and running. I love the Sheldon Bowl that's been built up right now. Farron doing a fabulous job of continuing to pile on the pressure using those Sheldon. Shiva, meanwhile, had pushed forward on the northern side. Sweeping away the base of Rage, who held out as long as he possibly could, but it was inevitable that once you lose that high ground, once you lose that geothermal up here, things start to get very dangerous very quickly. Suddenly, with the Shiva on the high ground, oh, and a massive nuclear connection here as well, Barrel loses tons of the army, and my goodness, bringing it back from the brink of devastation. The Orange Commander keeping up the fight, staying in the battle, and with a couple good nuclear connections, you can still see the craters on the map right here. Wow, that nuke has gotten some value. How many how many kills has that nuke gotten? Hold on, I know it's back here somewhere. Where was it? Where's that? There it is. 329 nuclear kills. That is brutal for the red for the blue team. It's wonderful for the red team. This composition over here is quite dangerous. We have loads of Mauser, Sheldon, Arbiters, all sorts of good stuff. Lightning tanks mixed in for good measure as well making this battle take forever. Those big siege battles take a long, long time. And it's not something I think the red or the blue team has the luxury of affording at this point. Pulsar's coming up in base right here for the Psy Incubator, trying to set up some sort of static defense that can kill the inevitable push of T3. Smelling that there's blood in the water. Nice connection from these poles. Coming across this from the angle, and from an angle from the side. Oh, brilliant bomber connections there as well. Juicy bomber connections from the Maroon Commander come across the long angle of the brown or of the purple forces, wiping out all the Sheldon over there. That is brutal. Just like that, everything that the blue team was using to hold the southern side has been wiped out in mere moments. T2 fighters finally pulled over here, but it's far, far too late. In just a moment, you can lose it to a unit or two, swiping away your entire composition. We do have gunships up on the northern side here, continuing to be aggressive. Farron's force significantly weakened. Karganeth now walking their way into the back line. Winterbite's going to be the primary target, at least for the time being. Quickly dismantled right here by those heat-seeking missiles. 
I think they're actually laser programmed missiles, I feel like. Yeah, because we can redirect them now. It means they can be, uh, yeah, they can be redirected in one direction or another. Pulsar putting in some work. Gunship's going to be quite nice here as well. The anti-air missiles are, well, fourfold at this point. Now firing away at those gunships. Not going to bring them down quickly by any measure, but certainly going to uh, whittle, them, uh, whittle them down slowly but surely. Hey, you know what? Maybe not so slowly after all. Those Karganas are actually putting in decent work against those gunships. Yeah, gunships are really struggling to bring them down. The Karganas do manage to make it into the base of the Seafoam Green Commander, Anonyx. Anonic X? Might be Anonic X. Commander goes down. No cloak on that commander means it will be detected by the Karganeth. It will be shot down promptly. And the gunships have now all but been dealt with as well, leaving no hope of any sort of retaliation on this backside. This is the air player knocked out of the game right here. Suddenly with units sweeping forward and the Shiva making their way forward as well. Karganeth about to pop the Aphis over here. Nice micro on those Karganeth, by the way, the Red Commander. Backing them up so they don't all die in the explosion. I think one of them should be pulled away. Either way, Aphis pops, Karganeth survive, and continue their rampage. Now going to move into the base of the Powder Blue Commander, who's losing on the front line now. We do have a Vanguard out, starting to fire away at those Starlight. It's a good counter to those Starlight, but they are very powerful. Once they get within range, their laser beam will tear you to shreds. Poking holes. Down goes that ever-so-important siege unit. Resign vote is called, oh, resign vote failed right there. The blue team holding out hope. The amphibious siege. Oh, nicely done. We snuck a little lab into the back corner over here. How cheeky. Taban managing to put a lab in the enemy's back line right here and then popping out some amphibious tanks to shut down all the production, following it up with the Marauder run by. Making sure that there's no way we can produce any sort of counter right here and the Marauder will be more than enough to clean up the rest of the space. T2 lab pulls. Fusion reactor in a lot of trouble here as well. Boom goes the fusion reactor, the Antinuke goes down here as well, and those amphibious tanks have thoroughly swept away everything over on this side. Fusion reactor dies on the northern side here as well, Pulsar's trying to clean up this Karganeth. Sharpshooter's doing a pretty good job here as well. When the Pulsar get a, gets a good connection, it can, wow, it can really blast this Karganeth down. Very, very good about that. E-converter's popping. Left, right, and center of the aggression through the northern side of this map. And the wonderful amphibious plays over here on the southern side have put the red team in a winning position by far. Advanced fusion reactors blow, and just like that, the uh, seafoam, no, pardon me, the powder blue commander goes down. Color is very difficult for me. Pulsar, or the starlight's blasting away at the Thor over here. It's like 2% per shot, but there's about 100 of them. <laughs> Boom goes the brilliant Terminator tank right there. No more shall be produced. Starlight's continuing to fire away over here. Trying to take down Karganeth. They are highly explosive, those Starlights, so every time one of them dies, if they're in a big ball, they do chain react. Not that it matters. Korra's dual commander is in a lot of trouble here as the uh, <laughs> Marauder managed to pop the both of them. Demon in the back line as well as the Karkaneth. It's a three-fold attack, a three-way uh, devastation for the blue commander. Three different colors in the back line. And the resign mode is once again resumed. At this point, the match has been well sealed. The red team playing with their hearts, still sticking in it to the very end. The blue team failing to capture that advantage that they got, pushing very early on. Capturing all that space up here where Bear was playing up on the northern side. Managing to capture, or not managing to capture, the uh, lowlands area over here. And eventually, the red team made the comeback. Two or three of the blue commanders still sticking in this for some reason. There are uh, a couple, couple hundred metal per second going to be enough to keep them in the game, apparently, against the thousand or so for the blue team. Only a matter of time. Here come the bombers. Long range anti air will not save you. Those heavy bombers pack a wall. Oh, maybe it'll save you. 
Bombers coming in from all angles, trying to deploy that payload. There go the fusion reactors, just like that. And it means all these static defenses are without power. Beamer turrets, pulsars, all the rest of it going to be without energy. Definitely a very easy way to turn off the lights. Just bomb the fusions. More bombers coming out here from the red computer. Cora, the last remaining commander on the blue team. Sticking with it to the very bitter end. <laughs> Sharpshooters without power here either means that these units can swarm forward. Boom goes the base. Nuclear missile connects with everything right here as the last commander sits, dancing his heart out under the sea in the southern lake. This game is well over. 14.6 metal per second up against about a thousand. Clearly this game has hit its end right here. The blue team finally taps out and the red team secures victory in this game of beyond all reason. Thanks again for watching. I sure hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you in the very next game. Peace out everybody and I hope you have a great rest of your day.